Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I'm Rebecca Stortz. I just joined Duke University. Previously, I was at Carnegie Mellon. Um, thanks so much for the organizers for being here. Um, so I'm going to talk about how I work on uh, sparse data, specifically for record linkage. So we're at a big data conference, so I work on merging many different uh, databases to remove duplicate entries. And so that's known as record linkage, deduplication, entity resolution, and it has many other names. And so specifically, you can view record linkage as a clustering problem, and that's what I'm going to focus on for most of my talks and new methodology. Um, and I'm going to talk about how some popular approaches, such as the Dirichlet process or um, more generally the pitt manure have a lot of limitations. And so what it has to do with is as the number of data points per cluster, um, it's not expected to grow without bound. And because of this, it doesn't really work very well for record linkage. And so I'll get into this um, ter in terms of motivation more um, throughout the talk. And so what we propose is a, a very new novel clustering model that captures this behavior. And it's actually a model and not a process. And that's, that's pretty important. And the applications in terms of why this is important is it's, um, it applies to many different important applications, such as precision medicine, uh, census data, investigative journalism. I do a lot of work on human rights violations uh, for the Syrian civil war. Um, but it also can be used for credit fraud um, and many other applications. So um, I like to do these catchy examples um, to illustrate what record linkage is. Um, so I've picked on Steve Feinberg enough, who was my postdoc advisor. So now I'm going to pick on um, Mike Jordan, who I um, rap in a band with. Um, <laughs> so whenever I talk about Mike Jordan, I used to talk about the basketball player because I played. Which one do you rap in a band with? <laughs> <laughs> So I, I used to play basketball a lot, so I used to talk about Michael Jordan a lot. But now I'm a statistician, so I talk about Michael Jordan a lot. And so when I talk about Michael Jordan my friends, you know, I talk about Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan, and then I say, oh, he's a really great drummer. And then they say, I didn't know Michael Jordan, the basketball player, was a drummer. And so then you kind of see this issue that comes up of Michael Jordan gets confused with Michael Jordan. And then if you go to Google and Google Michael Jordan, you know, the basketball player pops up, whereas if we're statisticians, we're usually looking for our beloved Michael Jordan down here, who's, you know, done so many great things for our community, the literature, et cetera. And so the question is, well, how do we distinguish these two people if they're in databases, and how can we properly build models for these? So I view this as a graphical model. Um, so you can think of having different databases here. I'm just viewing them as Apple, Amazon, and Google, but it could really be anything. And then I'm illustrating a cluster, or a, so I'm representing a person here as a node, so Larry Wasserman, for example. And each person or entity has attributes or features that are hiding behind them. So they have an address, they have an occupation, they have a gender. Um, Larry has two cats. He has a favorite color, which happens to be purple. And then if I look at Mike, then I probably think that this Michael Jordan and this Mike Jordan are the same person, because if I look behind at their features and attributes, then they're the same. But then if I look at Mike I Jordan and Mike J Jordan, and then I look at their attributes, if I actually look into them, then I see, well, maybe this Mike Jordan is a drummer and this Mike Jordan is a basketball player, and so they're not the same person. And then if I go a little bit further, just to further illustrate the example, and this information is publicly online on the white pages, then I can actually look up Michael Jordan's address and his age range, and you can actually get his telephone number, um, which is a little bit scary. And then for the Michael Jordan basketball player, you can only find this information. Um, so he has, it, he has it hidden. Sorry? He's, apparently, he's over 65. <laughs> And so these are clearly not the same Michael Jordan. So any model or method I propose, I want to be able to say that these aren't the same, these are not the same Michael Jordan, but then if I go back, if, if I have two versions that are similar but a little bit noisy, I want to be able to say that these are the same Michael Jordan as in the statistician who is also a drummer. So I'm going to propose a Bayesian generative model. 
Um, and why Bayesian? So Bayesian because I want to be able to do the record linkage simultaneously, so across all databases and within each database all at one time. And I want to do this so I can propagate the uncertainty or error of the linkage process. And so why do I want to do this? I want to do this, first of all, so I can know how much linkage error is across and within all databases. But I also want to do this so I can go do other analyses after and then use the record linkage error to be put in those other uh, subsequent analyses. So for example, if I want to estimate a population size, then I'm going to do something like capture recapture, and I want to be able to propagate that error in. Or if I just want to do something as simple as logistic regression, then I also want to be able to propagate that error in from the linkage process. And so that error is really important. And using a Bayesian way, you can do that very um, easily, whereas from a frequentist per perspective, you typically have to put a bound on it. So I've done some work in terms of taking records and you cluster them to a hypothesized latent, where the latent is basically random and it's dropped down from an oracle. Um, and from working on these papers, I found that it wasn't clear how to properly model or put a generative process on the latent entities. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. So bear with me now. I'm going to lay out a little bit of notation and then contrast what I'm going to call large clustering, which is more popular clustering, which is probably what you're all familiar with, where some, something new that I'm going to define, which is what we call small clustering. So I'm going to define um, x to xn to be the records or just any data you have that we're going to divide into k random clusters. And then each cluster will corresp correspond to a single latent entity. And then the Zs are going to correspond to cluster assignments. And then each cluster assignment is really nice in that it induces a partition pi on 1 to n. And the partition will be drawn randomly from some distribution, which I'll define in a new model in a few slides. So this partition, which we call pi n, is going to be a set of mutually exclusive and exhaustive subsets on 1 to n. And each subset corresponds to a cluster. So now if I think about the number of data points going off to infinity, so when n is really large, then I have an infinite sequence of records. And I also have a corresponding infinite sequence of cluster assignments. And I also have a partition on the positive integers. So I'll define this to be pi set of m. And so the probability that some record n is assigned to a cluster k is simply just what we define to be p n k, so just the probability that z n is equal to k. And then if I want to know the proportion of the first n records that are assigned to a cluster, then it's simply just summing up uh, this indicator and dividing by n. So nothing mind-blowing here. Yes? Uh, I guess the clusters are sustainable. I mean, why do these things depend on k? <coughs> Because I'm just, so the, the k is random. So what all I'm doing here is I'm saying that, I'll get into that later, where I'm basically conditioning on k. But for here, everything's interchangeable. But here I'm just saying that I have some records, and I'm going to divide them into k clusters. So you can imagine, for now, just a Kingman paint box. Little k, they vary across the little k because they're of different sizes. Exactly. Yeah. So there's many existing approaches for how to partition um, what we call pi inf, and this will yield an infinitely exchangeable um, random partition. And so here, then, the ZNs are identically distributed, not necessarily independent. Um, and of course, then, this probability of ZN equaling K doesn't depend on the particular N. And then by the strong law, Fn of k is going to go to p and k almost surely. And so the observed cluster frequencies will converge to the cluster probabilities. And then this, the important point here is that the size of the, the kth cluster is going to grow almost surely linearly with the number of records, which is not what you want for sparse clustering or sparse network data. And so if I think about it, so if the number of data points is growing off to infinity, for record linkage, what is really happening is the number, the size of the latent clusters is negligible compared to the amount of data that I have. And so that's very different from what you have from uh, traditional clustering approaches. 
Yes. So, so I'll define like so it's it grows at it grows sublinearly. So what we define is what we call the small clustering property. So this is new. So we say a distribution on the partition pi inf or on the cluster assignments on the z's has this cl this clustering property if uh, the f and k is going to zero almost surely as the data as the data is going off to infinity. So it just means the cluster sizes, as I said, are growing sublinearly in the number of records. And of course, following from this property, if some sort of distribution has this property, then it can't be infinitely exchangeable. And so this is a very key point here. So just as a motivational example of what typical data for record linkage looks like and just motivating why you would never want to put a Dirichlet process or a CRP on it, then over here on the left, we have 100,000 campaign finance donations from 2011 to 2012. And so what I'm looking at on the um, y-axis is the log number of clusters, and on the x-axis is the cluster size. So if I look at, for example, the first cluster, it's simply saying that their um, log 10 to the fifth um, basically clusters of size one. And out here, there are in this bin basically 10 clusters of size 85. And so you have this interesting kind of distribution here. And if you try and simulate it using a CRP of basically using the concentration parameter that's very small of 0.1 or even smaller, then you don't get anything that would replicate anything that would look like this finance campaign data. So what we propose instead is, uh, we call it permutation of Poisson sizes. We call it perps, because you could use it to find perpetrators in crime data. Um, K is the number of clusters. N is the number of data points assigned to each cluster. And then what we do is we take K and we draw it from a Poisson with parameter alpha. So Poisson is a distribution that's really light-tailed. So it will have this nice property that's very different from for example, the Dirichlet process. And then conditional on K, the number of data points is drawn IID, again, from a Poisson, now with parameter lambda. And so alpha is similar, again, to the concentration parameter, and lambda is equivalently the expectation of what you think the cluster assignments will be. So now we're going to assume that the data points are given, because traditionally in record linkage, we typically know that they are, um, like any applied problem. And then the vector of the cluster assignment z is going to be drawn uniformly at random from this set of permutations. And then the cluster assignments then define this really nice random partition on 1 to n, in which the number of non-empty sets is at most k. And so from this, we can. So you know how many entities there are in each cluster? Is that what is that? So, sorry. No. The, and, so the ends, yeah. n1 to nk are the data points, and k is the kth cluster. And then the z's are the cluster assignments. So it's saying this record goes to this cluster. So then the marginal distribution of the partition, which we call pi c for this particular um, model perps, can be written in closed form. And you can derive what we call a receding algorithm. So again, it's not a process, but it's akin to the restaurant process. Um, and if you run the receding algorithm for long enough, it's going to generate appro appro approximate draws from uh, the marginal distribution. And so if basically we just repeat the following. So if we remove a record, which is akin to like a customer in the restaurant process from the current cluster, you can think of here a table, then you simply then just receipt the record or the customer. So at each occupied cluster, with probability, it's here proportional to one. So you can contrast this with the Dirichlet or Chinese restaurant process where it's proportional to the number of data points. And so here you don't get the richer get richer property, which is what you don't, you don't want that. And then at a new cluster table, it's proportional to um, e to the minus lambda and then weighted by the concentration parameter. So I mean, in some sense, you just clustering based on a, a usual 
actual mixture model, mm -hmm. which would just give a plus on the number of components. Yeah, exactly. So the nice thing here, too, is perps doesn't depend on any distributional assumptions of the data. So here I'm just going to show a simple example of how we can do it for record linkage under categorical data, but you could put anything in terms of the data on top of that. Um, so here we're going to assume that some record can set consists of um, L fields or, or different features, so something like um, gender, um, date of birth, and then the records again are in X by N and the clusters are in X by K. And then each individual is represented by, again, a cluster assignment. And the cluster assignments correspond to a partition. And then we'll assume all of the fields are categorical value just for simplicity here. And we'll let 1 to ML denote every possible value for a particular field or feature L. And so the generative process in terms of categorical is very simple. It's simply that for a particular data point, we put a multinomial distribution on this with parameter theta, and then theta simply comes from a Dirichlet. So we're just doing a simple uh, multinomial Dirichlet since it's conjugate, and then we're drawing from the perps, which is a prior um, on partitions of all records. And this actually depends um, on Zn, which I'm masking because writing all of that out is a very technical detail that's beyond the scope of the talk. So just to show you how it works in practice for some survey data, um, this is a sample survey conducted by the Bank of Italy uh, about every two years. Um, and I'm merging together the 2010 survey that covers about 20,000 individuals with the 2008 um, survey with, again, about 20,000 individuals. And there are about 10 different categorical features or fields here. Um, and so we have unique IDs for this data set that are based on social security number. And so we can run basically the unsupervised method and then check to see um, how well we do in terms of, of accuracy um, based on our posterior plots and also based on FNR and FDR. So here we run perps for record linkage and we look at the posterior distribution of the observed uh, population size in sample. So here's the posterior distribution. The red line is uh, the truth on a subset of the data, which is 520. Um, and the posterior mean is 522. Um, the posterior standard deviation, I think, is around uh, 17. 520 is the number of identical people? It's the number of unique individuals. That's, that's, that's After du duplication. So we use the unique IDs to find out how many so I have unique IDs for the data set based on SSN. In so, the first database, didn't you have 19,000 unique IDs to begin with? Right, but here I was saying that I'm running it on a subset of the data. Ah. Just for some, I'll, I'll get to the computational issues at the, at the end. Um, so here I'm running it on a subset of the data. So on the subset, there are a total number of 797 individuals. And when you run the entire method, um, there's only 520 unique individuals, and the posterior mean from our method uh, estimates it at 522. Um, and then the, standard, the posterior standard deviation is 17. Um, and here we simply compare it to a Chinese restaurant process. Um, so here we're comparing it to a Chinese restaurant process with a comparable um, concentration parameter, and you can see that um, the population size is much, uh, it's underestimated quite a bit. And here, what you can see is that if you set the concentration parameter basically almost to, overestimated. Oh. sorry, overestimated, thanks David. Um, if you set the concentration parameter basically almost to zero, then you get really great inference, but you're basically putting a uniform prior on it. And you're also doing something methodologically that doesn't make any sense, and theoretically, that um, where you're breaking DeFinetti. Um, and so while you're getting good inference, you're also um, you're doing something that's statistically not sound. Um, and so this this kind of illustrates the difference here. So did, does your model have sort of weird, super weird scaling limits? Like even if you could pull it off computationally for an infinite Yeah, population, I'm going to get into this weird. here. Yeah. So here we do a comparison in terms of this 
small example in terms of comparing it to the most comparable method in the literature, which is just a simple mixture model for two databases using an improper prior. Um, and we compare it on the false negative rate and the false discovery rate. Um, and we do much better in both the error rates and in time. So their method takes an hour, ours takes a minute. However, ours doesn't scale for high dimensions well. And it's because you're doing these random permutations on that vector. Um, and this one minute is even when implementing split merge. Um, so we're working now on figuring out how to scale something better than that. You basically need better proposals. Uniform proposals aren't enough. Does that answer your question? No, I meant that the, um, even if you could do the computation exactly, I would conjecture <laughs> that the model will have bad scaling Right. But I think if you had better proposals, then. No, no, I, don't, I mean, like, for the exact poster. Oh, for the exact. Yeah, we could talk, yeah. That's something we haven't thought about for the exact posterior. Um, so, just to wrap up, now we're looking at. Um, so, we've looked at some sensitivity analysis of the concentration parameter and lambda and done comparisons to the Chinese restaurant process. And so now what we'd like to do is actually put um, priors on alpha and lambda so that they're actually chosen um, not by the user but, but by a prior. Um, we'd also like to do computational speed ups other than split merge for high dimensions so something with better proposals. Um, we're working on a string model that's based on a first order Markov model. Um, so that's currently in progress. And we're also working on simulation studies and ROC curves. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, oh, and I'd just like to thank uh, briefly the organizers again and also the Templeton Foundation for funding my research. So we have quite a bit of time for questions. Shall we? So quick. Are you aware of some work done by Peter McCullough? Um, I'm aware of a lot of work done by Peter McCullough. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly, I, what you did it reminds me, he, he had a couple of papers on something he got a permutation process for, for, for classification. So you may want to take a look. It's, okay. It's, it's on his webpage. Okay, great. Thank Probably you very much. some mathematical journal. Or something. Okay, I'm not aware of that, but thank you. Yeah, it's a sound to me like lots of things is, 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 is very funny. Okay. That, that's the theoretical part. The theoretical part? Yeah, I mean, all the serious stuff. It's, okay. It reminds me. Take a look. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, is there a way to kind of get hit roughly, like um, do some sort of preliminary kind of half ass clustering that can get the sort of right people forcefully together, but you don't know exactly how within that cluster they're clustered and then you could apply your thing in parallel? You know what I mean? So, yeah. So we've thought about doing something like random forests and then using that as like something like a, and getting them. I mean, if you got them down to like a thousand people. And getting them down into a thousand people or doing something like hashing and then using that as kind of like a starting point. We just, that's an idea we've thought about, but we haven't, we haven't implemented that. So, but that's a great question. Um, also, did um, the, um, the, the Poisson, do you let that depend on the, the, the number of records? Um, so you have a plus on for the number of clusters. It seems like that should grow at some smart rate with the, um, the number of records. Yeah, so currently it doesn't, it doesn't grow with number of records. Um, so that's probably something for future work in future directions. Um, we've also thought about like putting like a levy process instead. <laughs> Good luck with the company. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was another question. Oh, I was, I was saying, for preliminary clustering, I mean, it, it seems that in the case of trying to identify the same person across records, you can use something like um, the lexicographic similarity of the names, right, rather than starting with. So in terms of, are you talking about just in terms of doing some sort some really of dimension cool. reduction? No, no, just some... To reduce the space? Maybe seeding of, camp, of clusters sure, so based on, like, lexical similarity of the names. Some, you get everyone who's, like, kind of similar in name to Michael Jordan. Right, and then yeah. you say, this is the Michael Jordan cluster, do these so really belong? The way that we currently do that is using locality sensitive hashing, which is like is a yeah. super low hanging fruit. Um, and there's some linear time methods now um, 
in the literature by uh, Ping Li and one of his students that appeared in NIPS last year. And so that's what we use now. On all the attributes or just mm -hmm. the... You can run it in about 60 seconds and get a high recall and reduction ratio of around 97%. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.